Well, hello and welcome. This is Amy Wright Glenn, and I am the founder of the Institute for the Study of Birth, Breath, and Death. And I'm here with you for our March webinar, Such a Joy. Every month we have a webinar focusing on themes relating to our study. And this is a very special professional development organization that you belong to, bringing together birth workers and those involved in mindfulness training, like yoga teaching, and meditation, and then also those of us who work with the dying. So this is a unique and beautiful community of 140 people now. I'm grateful for each one of you. So thanks for joining me this evening, whether you are joining me live or listening to this recording, you're welcome. And thank you, uh, Wendy from Oakland. I love the note she just wrote on the chat, sending Northern Cali love to my peeps. <laughs> Great, thank you, Wendy. Lots of love to you. So welcome, this evening is an experiential Ex, um, experiential webinar and I have focused on planning your own vigil because I was inspired by this activity that Henry Fursco Wise led in a recent Inelda training. Henry is the president and co-founder of Inelda and that is the International End of Life Doula Association and he came to Florida last month in February and I attended the Inelda training. I attended the hours I could, I should say. I didn't attend the whole thing because of Tabor care. <laughs> but I, I was so moved by this particular activity, and I really am grateful to share it with you this evening. So this is what you'll need. For this to be, I think, the most meaningful it can be, if you could make sure distractions are, to, are placed to the side, if you turn off your cell phone, um, make sure you've you turn off your email or Facebook notifications. You just stay focused with me. It is a meditation. This will be, a, it can be at least for many, a deeply uh, emotional and inspiring and sometimes difficult experience. I would like you to have writing material handy. You can go get that right now if you don't have it. You know, a pen, some paper. If you prefer to write on the computer, that's fine. You can open up a document and then just go back and forth between the screen here and, and typing your responses. But there is something about writing in longhand, writing with a pen and having the paper there. So for me, that's how I prefer to write deeply personal points or ideas in my journal. If you have a journal, this might be an activity for your journal entry. So let me just pause for a few moments and let you get what you need for this evening. Perhaps you'd like to have a cup of tea handy and, uh, and a pen and paper would be wonderful. So again, welcome. This is Amy Wright Glenn. This is our March webinar on planning your own vigil. And it will be an experiential webinar. So I'm grateful you are willing to join me for this adventure. All right. I hope that you have your pen and paper handy. And if you're still getting it, that's fine. Just you know, bring your supplies near to you. And we will be diving in. I do have a few announcements to, to run over to some housekeeping pieces for the Institute before we, we dive into visual reflection. So I just came back from Utah. I spent 10 days in Utah. And it was a very moving experience. If you look at the very top of the map here, you'll see the word Logan, and it's cut off a bit. It's hard to see it, but that's a, a, the largest northernmost city in Utah, and that's where my dad is living. He's at an independent living home slash uh, every, uh, assisted living home, but he has this hybrid care system there, and he really loves Logan. Uh, my ancestors came to Logan when they converted to Mormonism in Europe, many of them helped settle Cache Valley, which is the northern part of Utah. So he feels at home there with the memories of his grandmother being born there and his mother being born in Logan. So that's Utah, and I just came back from the adventure. This is my dad. It was difficult. I do miss him. It was difficult to leave. It was very hard to leave. Uh, he's, you know, on hospice, his, his health is failing. There are a lot of tears. 
but I'm grateful for the opportunity to have been close and connect. And there were also moments of joy. He did get up a few times and explore with us. And we went to a Mexican restaurant one night and, and he had a lot of fun with Tabor, <laughs> even though, even though his body is frail and it's very difficult sometimes for him to move. Um, and even though he has lots of strokes, he uses a walker and he does get around and he found a way to make it fun for his grandson. And you can see Tabor's smile here. It meant a lot for us to spend time with him. So that was very meaningful. While in Utah, I also taught a training, a holding in space for pregnancy loss training. And that was really a, an exciting experience for me because I've taught this training online and I, and as I'm doing now with you, you know, through virtual connection, but to be in the room with women and men who are working with couples as they move through the difficult terrain of pregnancy loss was so moving. There were very few dry eyes in that room. There were quite a few tears, quite a few stories, and lots of re reflection, partner work, discussion, yoga, meditation. It was very powerful, and it was good to hold space for that training for me. And it helped me gather the courage I needed to be present with my dad as well. So I think about a lot about how we can grow through um, post-traumatic stress disorder events. I, I wouldn't say that I've experienced that with my dad, but it certainly has felt difficult. I wouldn't call it a trauma, but it's certainly a, a difficult experience. And then I think about people who go through true trauma. Um, this article from The New Yorker is about a family who, um, who lost one of their sons to murder. And it's a very powerful piece. I'm going to be sending it to you. And that will be part of our discussion for April. It will be the theme, how, how can trauma help us grow? Can trauma help you grow? There's a lot of study right now in, in a field called positive psychology. You might have heard of this. Marty Seligam at University of Pennsylvania, Jonathan Hyde at University at NYU, um, Let's see, Carol Dweck studies resilience, and she's at Stanford, Angela Duckworth at U UPenn. There's some great scholarship being done on positive psychology, which is this idea that instead of studying what, what ails us, you know, the DSM manual, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual is so thick. <laughs> we have so many mental illnesses that we've documented, but where's the manual for resilient living, for meaningful living, for service-oriented, loving, meaning, you know, the, the things that give life its juice. And instead of calling trauma, um, instead of imagining trauma always leads to post-traumatic stress disorder, why not also understand how trauma can lead to post-traumatic growth? So there's a whole study now on post-traumatic growth, and that will be the focus for April. I think it will be important for all of us to, to read this piece and to um, reflect together on it. There's also an invitation I have for you as part of the announcements to go to the Institute Facebook page. If you don't already, you know, like it and follow it and then share articles that come up that you find meaningful, share them to friends, share them with groups that you belong to, share them in different forums, because I post some really, I believe, fascinating pieces like that piece from the New Yorker. And this piece that I posted when death doesn't mean goodbye is completely fascinating. It's about a small community in Indonesia, and they keep the dead in their homes for up to a year or more post-death. And they bring food to the dead. I mean, they have the, the person's corpse preserved with a formaldehyde water mix, but they care for it in the home for a year or more post-death. And then even after the body is placed in the coffin and buried, they will frequently dig up the coffin, take the body out, and change the clothes on the body and then bury again. It is so interesting, so interesting. So I often post, I think, interesting articles about birth and death and meditation, mindful living. And I really hope that you go there and you read the ones that interest you and share. So it's part of the announcements. And then the last announcement is that th this is the year to renew membership. We have finished our first year. It's amazing, the end of this month is the first year of this institute. I started it last year, last March. Incredible. And so thank you all, the 140 of you who believe in me and this work and 
I'm so excited to see where this goes in the next five and 10 years. I will be doing this work for the rest of my life and I love it and I want to nurture it like I would a beautiful garden and invite you all to garden with me and nurture your dreams through it. So think about where you'd like to see the Institute go and email me your ideas and thoughts and uh, know that I'm very interested in, in your collaboration with me as we move forward. So all of that being said, let's begin. The intentions this evening are to help set a context for a deeper understanding of what it means to die mindfully. There'll be quite a lot of meditation. I'll have some music playing where you can just have some soothing music as you write. And you'll be planning your vigil through your writing. Now this is for you to, to keep and you can share as you feel inspired with loved ones. I, I've worked with many, many women as they think about birth and what they hope for and you can think of it like a birth preference list you know what do they want in their birth what's important to them what do i need to know about that woman so i can hold space for her birth in a very mindful and compassionate way so for instance i had one mom say if i if i hit a wall and i tell you i can't go on just remind me of saint sebastian and that will give me strength and she was a very devout catholic woman who was going for her VBAC after a cesarean and I promised her I would. So I wrote it down, you know, St. Sebastian. And then in her labor around eight centimeters during transition, she, she really wanted to give up. She said, I'm done. I'm done. I just need another C-section. I'm done. And it's too much. It's too much. And I just held her close and I looked at her face. I said, St. Sebastian. And it really, really, really worked. Somehow, I touched some very deep trigger of strength in her and she found the strength to vaginally have her, her second baby. So that's kind of the, oh, that's very much what doulas do, right? We hold space, we get to know, we find the clues that will lift our client up and, and she or he do the work, but we hold the space and we support. Imagine taking that intentionality to death. When you think about dying, how do you want to die? Who do you want there? Are there set special prayers or words that will be helpful if you get really scared, if you hit a wall? Right? We put this time into birth and reflecting about birth. I really believe it's so helpful for us to do the same for the threshold of death. So that's what this is, planning your own vigil. It's imagining when you die and what you want. So for an example, one may die in a hospital, and most Americans do, um, but it can be done mindfully. You can see here this person's dead, and there's flowers placed in a ritualistic way on the body. She's wrapped in a special type of um, black silk that must be something meaningful for her. There's a hands-on attention. So even though there's the machines, and it's a, you know, in some sense a sterile, cold location, what matters here are the doulas, the attendees, the women and, and men, the family that gathers, and the ritual is done. So you can think of that like a mindful hospital birth. You know, many women birth in the hospital. Most women in America do, over 95% do. But it can be done mindfully. So location matters, yes, absolutely. Most Americans do not want to die in a hospital. According to statistics, they, they prefer to die at home. But that's not what's happening for most. So, so when you imagine your own death, think of what could be done in a hospital location should you end up there dying that could bring this kind of intentionality to that experience. And rituals are, are vital. Would you want candles? If candles can be lit, would you have a special type of plant or flower in your hand? Are there certain cloths that you would want? How Would you want someone to brush your hair? certain prayers said. So there's rituals, there's location, and there's companions. Like with birth, who do you want there? Who do you want to cry and hold you and, and caress your body, even after it's still and dying? You know, the death has happened and, and you're gone. You could say, if you believe there is a life that moves out, that life is, is moved out and you have the presence of a form left that's lifeless. 
yet so much love still pouring over that body. Who will be the companions kissing your head, right? Loving you. So that's what we're working with tonight, these powerful themes of location and ritual and companionship. And I'd like to bless this circle, this experience with this song that I use when I teach the Birthing Mama um, prenatal yoga and wellness courses. I always start those courses with this, this chant that I learned at Kripalu, which is the largest yoga center in the U.S. in Massachusetts. And I learned this from a mentor there that I love, a woman named Suda Carolyn Lundin. I love her. She's a dear, dear mentor for me. And she taught me this song. So you can sing it with me in your mind. You could sing it out loud. You can just close your eyes and settle. But I'm blessing this circle of, um, of all of us, you know, across the miles. I see that there's about 11 of you with me right now who are listening live. And wherever you are, I want you to know I extend this love your way as you dive into the sacred work of looking at your own planning of vigil and death. In this circle, no fear. In this circle, deep peace. In this circle, great happiness. In this circle, safety. In this circle, no fear. In this circle, deep peace. In this circle, great happiness. In this circle, safety. In this circle, no fear. In this circle, deep peace. In this circle, great happiness. In this circle, safety. And let those beautiful words wash over you like water. So this is our work to design our own visual plan in a safe way, in a way that is courageous and peaceful. And you will hear the sound of a bell to help lead us into that meditation. I also have some soft music to play. And there are about seven questions that go through this experience. Each one I will don't dedicate about five minutes, four to five minutes with. You may find you need more time. Like perhaps that song you just want to keep singing. In this circle, no fear. It may be something you'd like to hear over and over. So if you find that you have lots to write, then perhaps dedicate each page to one of the questions and you can come back and fill in more. So you have seven pages for this event, right? You'll know, you'll know. So I invite you to sit up tall in your body right now and let the feet Rest on the floor, flat feet on the floor, or sit up and perhaps in a cross-legged position. Let your shoulders roll up, back, and down a few times. Face muscles are soft. Eyes close. Entering into silence for just a few moments. As we begin this ritual of designing our own vigil.
Okay. We open the eyes. And you have your pen and paper ready. And for the next five minutes, I'd like you to reflect your written word. Where do you want to die and why? Thank you. 
and take about a minute more here. I'm going to shift into another question. And keep that meditative spirit open. And if you find there's a lot more to write, make room on your paper. Make time in your life to come back to this. Where do you want to die and why? And shifting to our next question. How will the space around your bedside look, sound, smell, and feel? So get into the senses here. How will the space around your bedside look, smell, sound, or feel? Shifting gears here. And you'll see these questions are in quotes. They are Henry's words. I give him great credit for creating these beautiful questions. So how will that space be experienced by your body as your body dies? And now taking five minutes with this question as you dive further into the experience of planning your own vigil.
And take another minute here. Making space to imagine what you hope for. How will that space around your bedside look, sound, smell, and feel as you lay dying? And soon we'll be shifting to the next question. And take a few deep breaths. And notice if emotions arise. Letting the soft music wash over you. And we'll come back to it. But this question, let's work with silence here as we move in. To this reflection, how will you introduce a sense of the sacred so people come to your bedside with a different mindset? How will you introduce a sense of the sacred so people come to your bedside with a different mindset? And Henry uses the word sacred here. For those of you who are secular or atheist, perhaps consider the sense of mystery, or peace, profound grace and openness and love. Find words that will resonate with you, no matter what your tradition. Perhaps people gather in prayer or take a moment to meditate before they come into your room. Just consider, how would you intentionally help create a space of mindfulness around you? And write in silence the next few minutes as you reflect on this very important question.
and keep writing here, taking about a minute more as you reflect on the mindful creation of space around you. And you can come back to this again, like all of these questions, something to meditate on throughout the months ahead, the years ahead. The answers may change, but oh, how valuable to take this time to plan this vigil. And speaking of music, perhaps you prefer silence, but if you do prefer music, Consider what music do you want to hear during your dying process? Take the time to reflect on what this would be like for you. Take the next few minutes to write what music do you want to hear during your dying process, if any. Taking one minute more here. What music do you want to hear during your dying process? With a few more questions, take a deep breath. 
planning your vigil with great love. How do you want people to talk to you and touch you? How do you want people to talk to you and touch you? And take one more minute here. How do you want people to talk to you and touch you?
and knowing you can come back to this very important question at any point. And taking the time to shift your attention to the last few questions this evening. As you plan your own vigil. What people and or animals do you want present for your last breath? What people and or animals do you want present for your last breath? And take the time here to imagine that circle gathered around you circle of beloved ones. And take the next few minutes to reflect here. taking a few more moments. Probably one of the most powerful questions to consider. What people and or animals do you want present for your last breath?
taking a deep breath now. These are powerful images and powerful questions. When you feel ready, gently place your pen down. When you feel ready, let the writing go. Whatever emotions have arisen through this work, witness them with great compassion. Your sadness, your joy, your fear, your hope. Entering in silence with me once more this evening. And notice your breath, that precious breath. One day you will exhale for the last time. And this experience is designed to help that final exhale occur in the most mindful and most compassionate of ways. And death may come as a surprise, an accident, an unexpected visitor. But for many, it comes slowly, hopefully at the end of a long life. And the planning of a vigil is just as important as the planning of a birth. You set the intention Open your hands and surrender. So thank you for joining me for this experience. I hope it was moving and important. And I honor your courage to join me in this journey. I'll be sending the recording of this to you and you're welcome to listen to it again and Perhaps in a few months, try this experience again and see what might have changed in your answers. Oh, thank you. Grace Garcia writes, thank you, Amy. Namaste. Namaste to you too, Grace. Lots of love to each one of you. Thank you for joining me this evening. And feel free to share any of your writing with me if you would like to have someone else read through some of your words. I'm happy to be that person for you and just hold space for you. So lots of love. And Wendy, thank you for your kind words on the chat. I, I appreciate all of your great presence this evening. And I look forward to seeing you all in person when our paths do cross. Take care. Goodbye. <laughs>